In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, God is one. Amen. Well, for me, it is still uh, Wednesday, and uh, for you, it will be Thursday morning at 10 o'clock. This is because I shall be travelling from Lincoln to Shrewsbury, and then from there to the monastery uh, at the time that this is meant to be being shown. Hopefully I'll already have arrived in the monastery. That's my plan, so we'll see what happens. Yesterday we were looking at um, the Lord being asleep in the, in the boat. It appears that he is unconcerned. He is unconcerned in some ways because he has given them the orders to cross over and now in his body he has gone off to sleep. But that does not mean to say that God is not watching over them. Despite the ferocity of the storm that is whirling about them and making it look as if their ship is about to sink, it's not going to sink. The Lord is in the ship. The church will be preserved in the end. Not without a lot of hardship, but it will be preserved in the end. Let's then see what we carry on saying. Um, so they woke him, this is uh, chapter 4, verse 38 and onwards. Verse 38, But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose, and he rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, How can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? So the Lord is asleep in the back of the boat. Uh, it says on a pillow. Um, there's some discussion actually about whether this pillow was made of wood or was it like we might think of a pillow. Um, I know that in Somalia, where I used to live, the, the pillows there are made out of wood. They're, they're extraordinary things. They look beautiful. They're sort of a Y-shaped piece of wood, um, smoothed out, and you put this underneath your, um, really underneath the top part of your neck near your jaw, and you can then lie down on the ground with that there and it has a hole in the middle of it, you can push it up your arm and then this keeps your head off the ground and it's, it's very lightweight and usually they're very beautifully decorated um, I used to have a couple of these somewhere or other goodness only knows what became of them when I went to the monastery but there we go I can't remember, I don't really mind um, <clears throat> but then it says the Lord got up and a lot of the church fathers see this as a an icon of the resurrection, that they should see the whole business of the crucifixion of our Lord as being this great storm. The Satan batters the church. It looks as if it's going to sink. You have the waves and the wind and the howling of the, the screeching of the demons going around them all the time. And this is like the crucifixion of the Lord. They rest in the garden right the way up to the burial and the church all the apostles and the disciples look at this as the end we are perished we we are done for we're going to collapse and you remember they hide themselves away in the upper room for fear they say of the Jewish authorities and then the Lord gets up and he is angry Uh, just like in the resurrection, the Lord appears to be absolutely astounded with the apostles that they didn't recognize what was going on. They didn't know that he was going to rise from the dead. You know, if you read carefully the whole business about um, Jesus and Cleopas and Luke going to Emmaus or Thomas or any of the others, it appears that he is astounded they didn't take it on. I told you I'm going to rise from the dead, and they didn't take it on. Have you not witnessed the miracles that I've done? They tell you that I'm going to rise from the dead. And this is one of those as well. 
um, later on they would be able to think about this miracle, this happening, Satan doing what he can to wipe out the church. But the Lord is asleep in the prow, in the stern, prow is the front, in the stern. And then he wakes up and he says, he rebukes the wind. The word rebuke there in Greek can mean rebuke or it can mean command. He rebukes, he commands the wind and it dies down. He says to the waves, shut up. And she says that. Be quiet to the waves. And there's this amazing calm. And both those things are going to happen after the resurrection. When there's a different sort of wind, of course. But also, it's about to happen in the next three miracles. With the woman who has the internal bleeding, with a child who has died, and with the demoniac in Gergesa. He tells them, he, he rebukes, he commands, he quietens, he pacifies, he brings peace. And having silenced the waves, he tells them to be still and they're still. He then turns on his apostles and disciples, and he rebukes them too. Why are you fearful? Do you still not have faith? And don't you know who I am yet? That this is God. And of course, they've just seen an amazing thing. And they say to themselves, well, actually, the, the Greek itself, if you do a literal translation, is rather beautiful because it's in the present historic and it opens up in front of you. It says, and they feared with a great fear. And they were saying to each other, Who then is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Good question. And according to the Psalms, and there's several Psalms, but the most obvious one is uh, Psalm 107 in the Septuagint, verses 23 to 30, 106 in the uh, Latin version about those that go down to the sea in ships and trade upon, the, trade upon the great waters. And in there you have the mightiness of God, the one who controls the wind, controls the waves. And here we have the mighty God, for whom the waves and the sea is but nothing, nothing at all. If the Lord through a word can make everything come into being to the furthest corners, well, not really the universe has any corners, to the furthest, furthest corners of the universe and the four corners of the world, they will meet on the other side, um, then telling the wind to die down, be calm, telling the sea to shut up, is a matter of a mere nothing. Just like telling himself to rise from the dead is a mere nothing, a mere nothing for Christ. And yet for us, it leaves us utterly astounded. Now, where does this leave you and I? Well, to begin with, when we find that we are battered, utterly battered, and the church is battered by the demons, by life itself, by all the horrific things that go on around it, by uh, whole governments that choose to um, kill off the church by people who are enemies of Christ choosing to destroy the church then at that point we need to remain calm we remain calm we, re we keep faith we carry on doing good we carry on doing what we're meant to do we carry on being faithful to Christ we carry on sailing we carry on emptying out the bilges we keep on pumping up the water, we keep on trimming the sails, we keep on doing all those things that keeps the boat not just afloat, but heading for the shore. And that way, even though the Lord may look to be asleep, we fulfil his commandment. And this particular commandment was go to the other side. 
our commandment is to baptize everyone in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and to fulfill all of the Lord's other commandments, his commandments of love. And that can sometimes seem very, very difficult, especially when you see all the forces that are arranged against, arraigned against you. But for the Lord, it is a mere nothing. He speaks, then they melt away. And for us, although they appear to be terrible, the fact the Lord is in the stern of the boat is all that we need to know. And I said yesterday, for me, just now, about needing to be inventive. The members of the church must always be inventive. Like that St. Brendan that we celebrated uh, yesterday for you and today for me, um, simply because Tony was going off there, it's not his name day, uh, it is St. Helia's name day, so if Helia is watching, God bless you. Um, we also need to be inventive, risk-taking, thinking new things, thinking the impossible, doing the things that are not normally done, because the situation changes. Uh, we don't know how long this virus will last, as an example, and we have difficulties in having ordinary, everyday church services. I remember the last one we had in this building, I looked at the congregation as I came out to offer them communion, and I said to myself, and actually I said to the Lord, I wonder, Lord, if we will ever do this again. And the Lord said, mind your own business carry on doing what I told you to do. But within that mind your own business, we have to do things in an inventive and possibly naughty way. And that inventive, naughty way is what is going to get us to the other side of the lake. And those people who are not inventive, those people who decide to ignore the storm, those people who don't see the Lord asleep in the back of the boat or are not fulfilling his commandments will in the end be overwhelmed and will drown in the sea. Um, it's the way that things are. Um, it's not God's fault that they drown, it's their own choice that they do that. So we do need to be faithful, we need to be inventive, we need to think thoughts that have not been thought before, we need to do things that have not been done before, and we need to sail the ship in a way that it's not been sailed before. Um, to quote, I think it's the, the, the uh, satirical site in America called the Onion Dome. I don't think it goes anymore, but it used to. And it used to have uh, stories about Father Vasily, uh, for whom the church was 19th century Russia. And we're not in 19th century Russia. <laughs> Well, God bless you, God willing, Friday this will be live streamed and we will look at the Gathering Demoniac. God bless you, your prayers. Amen.